we cleared out over the course of a year or two the, the forest and um, started to plan a house. And this is prior to having a family, so it was my initiative at that point. Um, concurrently at, uh, at work, we were looking at ways of utilizing uh, some more secure sources of power for our security systems, and we've talked about this in the past. Uh, so I thought, well, it's, it's time to uh, try some of this at my own house, since I had personal interest in it as well. So we um, got the house to the point where there was a deck uh, attached to the outside. The inside was not yet finished. Uh, I decided not to run hydro down. Um, prior to that point, we had been running off generator to build the place. And uh, we put four, four solar modules on the deck and wired it into a uh, small battery bank and an inverter. And that gave AC power, suitable for you know running um, some small power tools, etc. Not things such as a table saw, but uh, that was never used in the project anyway. It was mainly small power tools, and uh, that um, led to the next step, which was the ordering of the Sunfrost refrigerator uh, from California, uh, touted to be the world's most efficient refrigerator, uh, also very elegant for building into a kitchen. So I ordered that thing, got it up here, built it into the kitchen, looked beautiful, then expanded the, the solar power system um, to meet its additional demand, which would be about another uh, four solar panels or modules was required for that. And uh, at this point, the, the, the house was half complete. The upstairs where I was living in and the downstairs was designed just to be a workshop and it was uh, sort of unfinished. Um, where did we go after that? Uh, since I was the only person living in the house, the electrical demands were not, not large. So I, I did okay for a period of time. How many watts or what was the... Um, that would have been, um, back in those days, only, only four, 400 watts of solar. Very small. Uh, of course, I was rarely here anyway to use power, so the only thing that was really on all the time was the fridge the, uh, and the security system. Back in those days, I was very careful of phantom loads. I used to have power bars and everything, and so there was no, uh, you know, parasitic loads when I wasn't here. Um, but then I put a uh, built a garage onto the end of the house because the downstairs that was originally designed to be a garage, I decided to um, make that part of the house. So we put the garage on the end of the home on a 45 degree angle off the house so that it faced south. And then I had uh, 900 watts of solar panels on the roof of the garage. So that's when we had the, um, the beginnings of a serious system. And uh, that gave enough power for, you know, um, running most things you need to run in a home. Um, that uh, was the state of affairs for about three or four, five years, I guess. By that time, we were into the business uh, as part of our day-to-day -day work, um, you know, actively uh, moving solar products and uh, installing systems. Because by that time, I had, uh, I suppose, a good five years of experience under my belt, and it tied in very well with uh, with my business, which was electronic systems and installations. Mm -hmm. So I sold that system. Um, you know, used solar modules were, were not a uh, they're kind of a scarce commodity, so. I had no trouble selling those things over a period of time at a good price. Mm -hmm. Sold my original battery bank to a customer. We, we put a backup power system in his home, so he's got that battery bank, which is still going strong. This is, uh, what, 12 years, 13, 14 years later now almost. Um, expanded the uh, battery bank to three times what its, what its uh, original capacity was. Um, it now stores about uh, 50 to 60 kilowatt hours of electricity, um, which is sufficient for at least one week of uh, running the home with uh, with poor sun conditions. So that's in the in the sort of the colder, darker parts of winter that that's yeah. required. Yeah. Yeah. November, December, January, and uh, even you know even still, generator uh, is necessary to make up for shortfall in solar power generation. So with the larger battery bank came a larger inverter, a uh, sine wave, latest, greatest inverter. Um, the same one's still running here today, 10 years later, uh, remarkably enough. Um, the solar array got expanded um, 
and put on a tracking system to follow the sun throughout the day. Learned some difficulties with having it roof mounted, namely snow in the winter. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to actually climb up there and shovel the snow off the front of these things. And that was problematic. Not a, not a proper solution to having power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we went with a pole mount system where the system is uh, standing alone on a pole and the angle can be adjusted uh, summer versus winter or seasonally. So it's very erect in the winter and the snow tended to you know, not accumulate on the front, the front of the panels. Uh, so that essentially solved the snow problem and also allowed it to track throughout the day. So in the morning the solar array is facing the east and at the end of the day it's facing the west. It's followed the sun all day. Um, when it gets uh, dark that evening, it swings back around to the east ready for the next morning. So, very good system. Um, and that was the, uh, that was the state of the, of the uh, power system for, uh, oh, five years. <clears throat> the next upgrade happened last year when we did a large renovation at this home. Uh, two years ago now, sorry. Um, same battery bank still, which is now... What uh, we're in 2004, since the, the battery bank is getting close to 10 years old, expected life would be 13 to 15. 15 is pushing it, um, so we've probably got another three years left. And now the solar array was expanded again up to uh, 1,500 watts of, of, of rated capacity, and that is uh, on a much higher pole now. We're, we're in a low-lying area here, so we have uh, shading problems from the trees early in the morning and later in the afternoon. So we've mounted it high to capture more sun hours throughout the day. And of course it still tracks throughout the day. Um, and we found now that we have more power than we need in the summer uh, um, on numerous occasions. It just, the system shuts, shuts off the charging. Um, but there's still a deficiency in the winter time. There always will be. Um, so the fact is, in uh, typical November here in southern Ontario, there's you know, there can be uh, almost no sunny days, and the days are short and overcast. So we need to make up for that shortfall of power by having an engine-driven generator at this point in time. Is that automatic, or how does that? All it could be. Um, the biggest you asked earlier. Uh, problems, difficulties. Uh, the biggest difficulty or ongoing headache has been generators. Um, the rest of the system is absolutely reliable, but generators have been um, problematic in uh, many different ways. Yeah, makes, I guess they're mechanical. I mean, they're, or what's been the problem? Well, the, 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 best, the best unit I had was a, uh, an old diesel, twin cylinder diesel off a, uh, a Lister. I got it off a uh, a CN caboose out in Alberta. I bought it off that guy for fifteen hundred dollars and shipped it out to me. And I used that for what three winters here, I guess, as the the backup to make up for the shortfall in, in, in power from the solar array. Right? And that machine worked beautifully; it worked perfectly. Um, the only problem was you had diesel exhaust and you had noise, and uh, neither of those two factors went along all that well with my my uh, you know notions of living um, environmentally soundly and comfortably. So I sold that and um, made a, uh, a poor investment in an automatic start fancy propane driven generator that was just a headache. And it's just a big paperweight out back now. Um, and I've heard this before about these things. They're, uh, they're not made for any kind of long term uses. They're strictly a backup standby type. Unit. So it, you know, automatic start, it would sometimes start, sometimes it wouldn't. It would shut itself off for no reason, just crazy. Mm -hmm. So, where are we at now? We, we're back to a gasoline. Um, at, now I have a, a, a DC generator, it's a thousand amp DC generator. It charges the battery back directly at DC. And because it's such a powerful unit, it only runs for a, uh, a few hours and we shut it off and we could be done for a week. Depends on how much sun there may be. But I'd say that uh, with this unit that I'm using now, our total generator running time might be, um, oh, I don't know, 50 hours. It's five zero hours uh, annually. 
And how, how much is the gas for that? Or good question. I just started using it last winter. Yeah. Um, when this propane thing didn't work out, I don't know. I might have put um, I might have put a hundred and hundred and fifty dollars of gasoline in it. And uh, I don't think gasoline is the solution for creating you know the uh, electricity that we need to make up for the shortfall. But it, it's a stopgap measure at this point. What we're, what I'm looking towards is the ability to store my excess solar generated electricity from the summer when I have more than I need, mm -hmm. store it in some means uh, for later use in the winter. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the way we're heading now would be electro electrolysis of water or, or some other medium to produce hydrogen or, or something. Is that, that like can, fuel cell? Then run it in a fuel cell. Oh, is that right? Yeah, we, we can do that right now. It's just it's expensive. Is it? Yeah. Any idea how much? I don't know. Uh, um, I've done some research and it's... The problem is you can't just sort of, uh, you know, say here's a package. Yeah. It's X amount of dollars. It's right. a little yeah. bit of experimentation and fiddling still. Mm -hmm. But I would think in um, two to three years, I would expect I can, I can use that here. Uh, my goal is to be one of the first users in the country, um, if not the first, in a... Uh, off-grid residents to utilize a uh, electrolysis and fuel cell system to eliminate an engine-driven generator. Because hmm. um, then we have the situation where the solar array could be sized to suit the annual requirement of the home electrically. Okay, you, you can't do it with a battery bank because you can't store enough. Right, so you do the math that determines how much you generate and then you know how to size the storage. Yeah, I would think we would actually do some accurate measurement as to our total kilowatt hour consumption mm -hmm. over the year. And we'll just size the solar array to suit because that's what we do. Um, at work every day we size systems, so we're very good at that now. And uh, we would size it maybe 20% larger and um, not knowing yet the efficiencies of the you know, electrolysis and fuel cell system. But uh, that's the goal, is to have it a, a self-contained how can I term it? Self-supporting closed-loop system that doesn't need outside energy from from um, petroleum-based sources. Mm -hmm. Lots of daylighting. So there's never never been a light on in the daytime in this house. I think I can safely say it. Other than like the utility room where there are no windows. So um, that's that's one way of saving a lot of electricity. Is let let the let the sun shine in. Uh, it also helps to stay warm in the winter. And. Uh, this house was not designed as a, uh, you know, some kind of a uh, masterpiece in energy conservation or utilization. It uh, it happens to be quite efficient. But, um, that makes a lot of sense. I would also, you know, in, in the future, if I were to um, look at increasing efficiencies, I would uh, connect the wood stove into the floor system and, and capture, at the very least, the heat that goes up the chimney. But there's methods of, of wrapping your, your stove with copper lines and uh, extract that heat directly mm -hmm. and um, store it in the floor. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we're, we're close to, uh, I suppose, close to 10 inches of concrete from this floor now because there's two layers. So the thermal mass is large. And uh, once it's warmed up, it takes a while to cool down. Yeah. You have to be... Um, cognizant of your, your energy usage at all times. You, you, you know, you, uh, you'll, how could I say it, you may undergo a um, uh, period of time where you will um, adjust and then after that you've made the adjustment and you're fine. But I think people would uh, understand quite quickly how um, unconscious they are of, of energy usage in, in the home. And you become conscious when you have a finite resource with anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so, for someone who wants to unplug from the grid after living on the grid for however long, and then plug into an off-grid power system, they're going to have to be um, made aware of uh, the need to really look at, uh, you know, most of. How can I say that? Uh, how best to use the electricity you have available. And there's plenty of it available if the system's been designed and sized properly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it, it doesn't mean you would put your sprinkler on, leave it on all day in your yard, and have that pump running all day long. 
but maintaining the systems and stuff like that, is it a big job? Or? Um, zero. <laughs> really? <laughs> Therefore, it's not a big job. Yeah. No, typically now, uh, we put a display unit in the kitchen. That's a common, a common busiest place in the home. So there's a, uh, a, a, a display unit on the wall where at a glance you can say, okay, here's where I'm at. Uh, analogous to the gas gauge in your car. Something you glance at every while to make sure you can get to where you want to get to. Okay. And it, it shows you what, what is on there? Uh, it'll show you a percentage of uh, power available. So if it says 75%, you've got three quarters of a full battery. And um, if you're, you know, um, let's go up with the scenario here. You're having your annual party where you have 100 people over. And uh, they gobble up as much power as they can because the fridge door is always open and water pumps going and all this. But that coincides with a period of really bad weather where it hasn't been sunny for a few days and it's not predicted to be sunny for a few days after that. What's going to happen is you're going to run your battery bank down. You're going to have very little replenishment from the sun. And you're going to have to have an external means of, of acquiring some more power. And there's the generator need right there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Or wind turbine. Mm -hmm. um, but it could also happen to be not windy through that period of time. Right. So what I'm really saying is the risk of running out of power always exists because you truly are dependent upon, upon uh, Mother Nature. Right. Um, now fortunately though, uh, we have uh, in our own case over a decade of experience uh, with weather patterns and, and what does it give us and it's, it's about the same every single year. On so you, yeah, you'll know after the first year if, if you're going to go off grid, how much you're going to have. But I guess you could say it's, it's maybe the adjustment period from living on grid is going to be a year because you're going to have a year of understanding what the different seasons have to offer you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in terms of availability of energy from the sun or the wind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it'll be the same every year. Hmm. So that, that's probably the, one of the most important points right there is you know, understanding when you've got the most power available. What we have, the um, <clears throat> solar array is a... Uh, about 75 feet out the back of the house. The cables come up uh, underground through PVC pipe up into here. And there's uh, s whoops, six pairs of conductors. Um, so every two solar modules are wired together uh, in series. And then there's a total of 18 modules. So they all come back on six pairs of wires. Uh, they come into a, a 60 amp circuit breaker on the side here. Uh, and then that power from the solar array flows into this uh, charge regulator. And uh, this is uh, quite a sophisticated unit that, um, if you want a long technical explanation, I can give it. But we'll probably keep it short. Um, when, when solar uh, modules are very cold, the colder they get, they're capable of actually producing more power. So in the winter time, um, their voltage goes up. And this device makes use of that characteristic and turns that, that voltage into charge current into the battery. So as opposed to the uh, earlier days where you would uh, essentially directly, directly connect your solar array to your battery bank, uh, we can realize here um, a good solid 25 to 30 percent gain in charging current uh, in the winter time. So very valuable device. Uh, also provides lots of metering and, uh, and data on how much we've generated how much is coming out of the array right now, etc. So that's kind of the information center. So the power flows into there, comes back out of there, um, goes onto one side of this big 250 amp breaker, which then connects to the battery bank through this pipe. And the battery bank is up behind the house in an insulated cabinet. And the battery bank right now is 22.6 degrees Celsius. Um, and in the winter time, it, uh, maybe we can read how cold it did get. It got, it got as low as minus 4 in the winter. And we've seen minus 30 here in the winter, so it's, it's well moderated inside that cabinet. Of course, the, uh, the warmer you can keep your battery, um, the more usable capacity you'll have. You don't want to have a battery that's at minus 20 or minus 30, because you don't have a whole lot of power left to use at those temperatures. This, uh, this breaker uh, is what um, provides the protection for the 24-volt DC that comes into the inverter uh, right here. 
produces 120 volts AC, sine wave power, the same as what comes out of your electrical outlet uh, if you're plugged into the hydro grid. And um, this runs the whole house. We could turn everything on in the house at the same time, and this will run it all. And uh, we've done that just for fun. And it's, it's a, a huge load, somewhere around 40 amps AC, or around uh, five to six thousand watts, and that runs it quite happily. Um, then we go into a regular uh, AC hydro panel. That's the cable there, and uh, from there on, it's just a, a standard system as any any house would have. I've missed one thing though, this metering device here, it uh, logs um, how much power is left in the battery and it actually shows 65 percent remaining in the battery right now. And that, there's calibration required which I've not actually done in intensely, but that's reasonably accurate. The battery is anywhere from 65 to 75 percent charged right now. It may lead you to ask why in the middle of the summer would we not have 100% full battery. Uh, the reason is we've had a few cloudy days in a row and we've been using a lot of power here lately with finishing uh, construction on the side of the house. Saws and etc. Central vacuum, dishwasher, a lot of things have been running over the last couple of days. And then that will be made back up to 100% on the first, first uh, day and a half of, of sunny days that we have. what, 13, 14 years now, that little pump right there, it's a third horsepower jet pump. Mm -hmm. um, a word of a, or a sort of a theme of philosophy here would be to, in an off-grid home, don't use things that draw more power than need be. Normally that would be much larger uh, because our well is about 400 feet away from here, up the driveway. You would generally um, have specified for you a much larger pump, I would think a three-quarter horsepower anyway. But once we got the system primed and working, a third horsepower jet pump works perfectly for us and um, provides everything we need, or that anybody would need for that matter. Uh, it just made it more difficult to get the system up and running at first, trying to draw that water from such a distance. So that's um, a, a minimal sized pump that works well. And we have a uh, ultraviolet water sterilizer here to make sure we have pure water out of the well. This particular one we chose because it runs on 12 volt DC um, and it used a lot less wattage than one that would uh, uh, run on 120 volt AC. It does the same job for us. Um, so back up in here, inside this box up here, there's a uh, converter that converts a 24 volt DC from the battery bank down to 12 volt DC to run the water sterilizer and the security system. Those are the two things that are uh, 12 volt in this house. There is actually one other DC appliance, which is the Sunfrost refrigerator, but that runs on 24 volt DC. Okay. So that's the water system. Um, the preheat, the preheat tank here will be uh, fed. Um, we hope within the next year from a, uh, a solar thermal energy source. Uh, that's um, going to happen at some point, but not fully planned out yet. But that will preheat the water that gets fed into this uh, Renai uh, on-demand propane-fired boiler. Um, so this device turns on when a hot water tap is open. Only when you need hot water do you use any energy to heat water. Um, hence, higher level of efficiency and overall uh, better utilization of propane than keeping a big tank of hot water hot all the time. And the um, interesting thing about this is it, uh, it modulates itself based on how much water you have running. So it'll, I believe, go down to a low of, of 22,000 BTUs up to a high of 180,000 BTUs. So the, the, the flame inside actually changes based on how much water is flowing through it. So in wintertime, this uh, runs and heats the uh, radiant floor in this house through all this piping. These, these circulation pumps keep the water flowing through the floor, through this unit, which is running um, quite often on a very low flame mode, very low BTU, and it keeps the floor warm. When we open a tap for hot water, this fires up to a higher level, and then we're simultaneously heating our floor and providing our hot water. 
so one unit does it all. And we can right here adjust our, our temperature, uh, water temperature as required, right in degrees Fahrenheit. These uh, pumps, I selected these, they're actually there's one more DC appliance that I forgot to mention. These are actually 12 volt DC circulation pumps. Each one draws 3.1 watts. Very low consumption as opposed to um, uh, AC powered uh, circulation pumps for radiant floor systems. I think they're more commonly 40, 50, 60 watts. So once again we've got uh, the smallest possible load required to do the job here. So when the whole heating system is operating, I've got 9 watts for circulation pumps and this thing draws, I believe from memory, around 45 watts of electricity. So my whole heating system is drawing like 50, drawing as much as a 60 watt light bulb, <laughs> which is uh, uncommonly low. And uh, that was another very large advantage of going this whole heating system versus what we used to have in here, which was forced air propane heating. We found the furnace on a cold winter's day was on an awful lot. I never did measure the number of hours, but I, I suspect it was probably on for six hours out of the 24-hour period. Uh, and I would say for an off-grid residence, this would be, um, in my mind, the only way to go for heating. It doesn't have to be in floor. You could have uh, you know, radiators. Um, there's radiator-type baseboards. You know, lots of variations on the theme but use some form of radiant heat versus uh, running big fans to blow hot air around. Um, yeah, so the sun frost, and other than that, there's nothing unusual in this house, um, appliance-wise. Appliance-wise, it's all... Microwave standard, and propane stove. Propane stove, yeah.